their lives. Today, we'll be learning the facts. Dr. Deborah Ulipka is a professor of Holocaust Studies at Emory University in Atlanta and has written many books, including History on Trial, My Day in Court with a Holocaust Denier, which has recently been changed to the name Denier. Denial, which is the name of the movie. She was sued for libel in 1996 by David Irving for having called him a Holocaust denier. After a 10 week trial in London in 2000 and an overwhelming victory for Dr. Lipsa, the judge found Irving to be a neo Nazi polemicist who engaged in racist and anti Semitic discourse. I know Dr. Lipsa and Deborah. My family is honored to have such a role model as a close family friend. Deborah has been at my siblings' weddings, joined us for Shabbat and holidays, and is now here at my school. Deborah has taught me the importance of believing in something and standing up for that belief. I would like to thank the school for creating this opportunity for her to come to speak with us today and to thank Ms. Johnson in particular. She has waited almost three years since my freshman year to have this and we now make it a reality. So we appreciate her efforts to make this to be this conversation. Today's panel will be led by Ezra Michelle and Ruthie, in addition to the remarkable historian of Dr. Deborah. There's a Jewish connection. If you know a Jewish uh, teaching that, that tells you that, Chachamim Kizaharu Bzibrechem. Chachamim, wise people, learned people, be careful with what you say. So I'm not putting myself in the category of Chachamim, but um, as was meant by that phrase, but still, when you know your voice is heard, be more careful about what you say. So when watching a movie, something that really struck me was the fact that Holocaust survivors were not brought up during the trial um, to the treatment of witnesses. How did you feel about that at the time? And if you could, would you change that? Uh, no, first of all, I always said, consider the outcome. We won a really big victory. So whatever we do, whatever the lawyers did, they did right. Um, but as I was explaining to some of your classmates earlier, um, we had two options, uh, we, the lawyers had two options when uh, creating a forensic or legal strategy. They could have taken all the information about the Shoah and said, David Irving says there were no gas chambers, here's reams of evidence on gas chambers. David Irving says there were no Jews killed here, here's reams of evidence. David Irving says the six million number is a uh, made up number here, reams of evidence about that. But that would have created a level playing field. 
particular point, are information that he would have taken and sort of begun to attack that information. Now, he would have attacked it with lies, but it would have ended up in debate between those who say there was and those who say there wasn't. We chose a different strategy. Our strategy was to prove to the judge, remember, we had the burden of proof, the onus was on us to prove the truth of what I said. It's not, that would not have been the case here in the United States. This is one of the reasons why he waited to bring the case in England. Um, the word of proof was on us to prove the truth of what I said. Uh, the truth of what I said, and not on him to prove the lies. In this, in this country, if you want to sue someone for libel, that's writing lies about you, or for slander, for speaking lies about you, you have to prove that they lie. In England, if you have said the words or written the words, the burden is on you to prove the truth. So we had, a, that's why I couldn't ignore the case. There were many people, um, including people in the Jewish community, but uh, certainly academics and others who said to me, oh, ignore this, it's ridiculous, nobody will believe him. And I said, but if I don't fight him, he wins by default. Unless I, if I don't fight him, he wins. Um, and I couldn't have, you know, Someone who, and then he could go around saying, my, David Irving, my version of the Holocaust is the true version. Uh, and his version is, of course, no six million, no plan to kill the Jews, no gas chambers, and the Jews did this all to get a state and to get money reparations from the Jews. So um, what, what, our, what our legal strategy was, I say ours, the lawyers figured that out and I listened to it and said, it's the right one. Um, was instead to follow his footnotes back to the sources. How many of you use footnotes in your work? Source notes, okay? Um, the old years, you can take them for footnotes? Teacher. Oh, 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 okay, so, no, source notes. How many of you use source notes in your paper? All right, now I can look at it. Um, but, um, thank you. Uh, we followed his source notes back to the source. So when he said, I have evidence to prove that Hitler was livid with rage when he heard about Kristallnacht. You all know what Kristallnacht is? The November 38th program against the Jews throughout Germany, burning the synagogues, destruction of Jewish institutions, Jewish shops, murder of many Jews, etc. That Hitler heard about this and was livid with rage. And he gives you a telex. So his footnote is, or the UMLA source note would be, um, a telex that went out from Hitler's uh, uh, office, or Hitler's office via Hitler, uh, or Hitler via Hitler, um, at 1.26 in the morning, the night of Kristallna, uh, saying, and, and David Irving writes, at 1.26 in the morning, Hitler sent out a note, stop the man. So David Irving says, you see, here's Hitler trying to stop this. This was a rogue action, an action by a few crazies, whatever, which of course, it doesn't fit the facts. The facts were that in every city in Germany, the synagogue was burned, immediately leaders of the Jewish community were arrested, and the list was there before, so they couldn't have been prepared on the spot. Uh, you know, it all went according to clockwork. Even Newsweek magazine writing about it, that the Nazis uh, say this was a, a spontaneous action, but it's, it's amazing how, uh, you know, spontaneous exactly the same in every year. Um, so he has this uh, footnote. We would like to look at what the footnote, what the telex really said. And the telex said, arson against Jewish shops and the like is to be bold. Stop the arson. They were setting fires. Why did they want to stop the fires? Because they were burning up entire blocks. So you burn up the synagogue, well, it's in a block where there's stores or buildings on both sides. The fire doesn't stop when it finishes burning down the synagogue. It keeps going. So you can keep destro destroying them. You can keep ransacking them. You can keep arresting Jews. You can keep going into Jewish houses and destroying them, throwing Jews out the window. You can keep doing all those things. Just stop the arson. But in David Irving's interpretation, that stop the arson was translated into stop it. So we would show, oh, and, and there's an example, one or two examples of that in the film, but we showed in 30 different cases where you couldn't trust what he said, that what he said, he didn't have the proof to prove it. In fact, he was lying about what the, uh, what the sources said. So for something like that, we didn't need survivor's testimony. 
survivor's testimony would have been in legal parlance, with, they would have been, uh, survivors would have been what are called witnesses of fact, as opposed to expert witnesses. Let's say, God forbid, you're standing next to the Potomac and you see a bridge fall. Now, you're not an expert on building the bridges. You're not an expert on, you know, construction of an uh, 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 engineer. But you can describe to the experts, yes, it started to collapse from the middle when a big truck went over. Or it started to collapse from the two sides when there was no traffic on it. You you're a witness of fact to attest to exactly what you saw. That's what a survivor would have done. We didn't want to put witnesses of fact in front of the court. A, because they would have also been cross-examined by David Irving. We didn't want to do that to a survivor. Um, you know, for an 80-year-old person to be cross-examined by someone who you think we just want to trip them up. Um, but also, we wanted to say to the judge, look, this happened. We're not debating whether this happened. We're showing you that this man is alive. So that was, so in the, in the movie, they, they make it a little, they make my desire to have uh, survivors testify a little bit more of an issue than it really was. But, but that was the reason for it. Can't debate with deniers. Is there any point of disabusing them of the ideas that they have, like Holocaust and the other issues? No. Um, yes, but no. <laughs> um, I don't think you can change the mind. Look, I think, let's first figure out what denial is. Holocaust denial is not a result of a cognitive error or a cognitive omission. It's not like the deniers didn't get the memo or didn't see a certain document or didn't read a certain book. Sometimes people say to me, oh, look, Deborah, they discovered just now they managed to recreate um, notes from some Sundra Commando uh, who had taken notes in, you know, Sundra Commando, a Jewish, the, the Jews who worked in the gas chambers who, and then were killed every six months because they seemed to have to meet One of them kept very exacting notes. The notes were buried. And through contemporary scientific method, they've been able to figure out what the page is said. So someone said, hey, Deborah, we could show this to the deniers. This proves that it was. I said, the deniers are not interested in fact. The, the Holocaust has the dubious distinction of being the best documented genocide in the world. Probably only uh, the, the Armenian genocide may be second. Um, we can't do that. We have the so when deniers are deniers, it's not because they don't have a piece of the agreement. It's that they're haters. They hate Jews. They love Nazis. And anybody who will tell you, this is a little parenthetical remark, but we're seeing in our country right now. I'm a, I'm, I love the Nazis, but I also love Israel. Don't believe them. You can't be a Nazi. You can't be a supporter or a lover of Nazi ideas and say you're not in this And so, um, so when the uh, deniers, deniers, you know, let's say you got on the airplane, and uh, which I just got off of, and uh, you happen to talk to the person next right here, talk to the people next to me, because you know when you do, oh, I write out the Holocaust. Oh, that was terrible, but. Why did the Jews fight back? Why did they fight? You know, I, I, mean, I don't want to spend nine. I'm walking the flights a long flight. I don't want to spend nine hours, you know, explaining why why anti-Semitism is effective. But let's say I made a mistake and I said to the person, "This is what I do," and the person, "Oh, I heard it never happened," and they or they're a denier and they begin to tell me. My question to them would be, if if um, let's say I know nothing about it, it's not me, but if someone who's tabula rasa about the Holocaust knows nothing sits down next to a denier on a plane, and the denier says, oh, the Holocaust never happened. And explains it never happened, never happened. What would be the logical question you would ask of someone who convinced you maybe it never happened and the Jews have made this all up? What would be the logical question you would ask? What is proof? Okay, what else was Why? What's in it for the Jews to go to such effort to make up the story? There's got to be some payoff for them. And that's where, as I mentioned earlier, the payoff, I put that in quotation marks, 
what when we said what did the Jews that I put quotation marks get out of the Holocaust? What did they get out of the Holocaust? Israel. Okay. Reparations, which is a fancy word for money. Money. And you say Israel. Actually, that's not true. And, and you, you really should correct it right now. Because it's students in this school, and you're not alone. I go to Jewish audiences all the time, and that's the answer. Yes. There would have been some Jewish political entity in the area called Palestine without the Holocaust. In 1936, there was the Peel Commission by the British trying to figure out what to do. And it, it advocated uh, separating Arab territories from Jewish territories. So there would have been something. But the general impression of the world is that the Holocaust, that Israel is a result of the Holocaust. Israel was a result of the Holocaust. It would have been established in 1945, 1946. Israel was a result of the fact that the British didn't know what to do, and they pulled out. Um, the, the people who would have populated the Jewish state, most of them were killed. So the idea that Israel is a direct result of the Holocaust is really not true. But that's what the impression of the world is. You absolutely are reflecting what most people think. So you say to them, oh, the Jews did this to get a state and to get money. And what does that involve? If you think, what every prejudicial stereotype whether it's a prejudicial stereotype about African Americans, or it's a prejudicial stereotype about Latinos, or it's a prejudicial stereotype about homosexuals, or it's a prejudicial stereotype about any of uh, women, um, it has certain basic components. The African American stereotype, not true, stereotype, is lazy, dumb, welfare chief, etc. Not true at all, but that Stereotype. The stereotype about homosexual men, let's see, they be a feminist. You know that. The stereotype about homosexual women, um, the, 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 the term used butch, you know, not true. The stereotype about Italian, mafioso connection. There was a, um, an automobile executive, very famous one, named E. I. Apoca, who used to work for the Ford Motor Company. And they never made it to the head of Ford Motor Company because Henry Ford, the fourth, third or fourth, those were chairman of the board, the Ford family, always said because his name was Iacocca, he must have mafioso connections. So, uh, Iacocca left Ford, but the Chrysler, same Chrysler, and the fact that there's a Chrysler brand today is in great measure to the Iacocca. But he just made that assumption. Mario Cuomo, the father of the current governor of the New York, the New York State, the former governor of the New York State, was told when he graduated from law school, if you want to get a job in a, in a nice Wall Street law firm, lose a couple of the syllables from the, of, the, of the vowels from your name, Iacocca, who's too clearly an L. So there's always a stereotype. What's anti-Semitic stereotype? What's the essential element of anti-Semitic stereotype? Money and what else? Well, not devious. Cheap. Jews cheap. You can't trust the Jews. You can't. In fact, in France, in the Middle Ages, when Jews testified in court, they had a special oath. They had to give a special oath because you couldn't really trust them. And Jews are devious. It all goes back to the story in the New Testament of the death of Jesus, the killing of Jesus. And supposedly, the Jews did this. Even though Jesus was a Jew, everybody in the story was Jewish, except the Romans who actually killed him, but that's a fact. We don't care about that. Um, it's all rooted in that. And that why did, why were the Jews so angry with him? Because he wanted to chase the money changers out of the town. So they were they were he was hurting their financial resources. So they had him killed. Even though they were depriving the New Testament, even though they were depriving the world of the wonders of this peace-loving uh, Son of God, that's what that's about. But they did it. So you take that into the story of the Hol Holocaust and liars, and they say, why are the Jews making up this story? To get a state, it doesn't matter to them that they're displacing the people from their homeland, all these kind of things, and to get money. So in other words, you, you, it clicks. You know it. Click, oh, I know. Jews do that. Jews do devious things. Jews do devious things.
TV is fixed for money. Jews don't care about others. So, so the denier is an answer. To be a denier, it's not that I, I was told this, I just didn't get, I didn't read one book on the Holocaust. If I had read nine, if I had read uh, a good history book, I would believe it. You have to be first an anti-Semite to come to that. So it's not the deniers I'm trying to educate and trying to reach. It's the people who might be affected by it. It's the person in the, in the seat on the airplane who sits down next to the denier. He says, oh, that's why they did it. Oh, well, that's familiar. You can't live, have lived in the Western world without having been exposed to anti-Semitism. You may not be an anti-Semite, but it's just like you can't live in the in, in America today without having been exposed to racism. It's endemic. It's endemic. It's there. You can deny it, but it's there. So, so when someone hears this, it makes sense to them. Jews do those kinds of things because they want money and they don't care. It's one of the reasons why your parents, if you ask your parents about this, when you hear stories about things like the Jewish lobby on the hill, we bristle in a way that when people talk about the tobacco lobby, the tobacco owners of the companies don't bristle. Because it implies a certain deviousness. It implies that Jews are doing things that aren't quite right. For their own personal, they'll, they'll do anything for their own personal benefit. So that's a long answer to it. Um, I think Michelle, I have a question. Uh, if they're hired, don't go and select the office, but if you don't have too much income, I'll have Donald Trump's election effective year work. I'm, if you follow me on Facebook, you know, or some of your parents may know, I'm not a supporter of Donald Trump. I don't think he's an anti-Semite. I don't think he's a Holocaust denier. I think what has happened in America in recent months, years, and couple of years, is a greater room for vision. A greater room for um, anti-Semite. The people marching in Charlottesville with swastikas and Confederate flags and tiki torches, which were popularized by the Nazis, were not nice people. Nice people don't march with swastikas. Most nice people, nice people don't march with Confederate flags. The Confederate flag talks about, I live in the South. The Civil War was about one thing and one thing only. Owning the right of, you, of one human being to own another human being. People talk about states' rights, but the states' rights for the right of you, one human being to own another, to own and sell another human being. So, what we're seeing today in America, on the right and on the left, is an institutionalization of hatred and a mainstream of hatred. I go on the neo-Nazi website. I go on the white supremacist website. These people hate people of color and they hate Jews. And Jews have got to understand that. These people hate you. They're contextualism. Lately, some of them have been talking more positively about Israel because they also hate Muslims. They, oh, Israel knows how to show them. But believe me, they hate you. And that's what they chanted in Charlottesville. What did they chant in Charlottesville? You, Jews will not replace us. And what else did they chant? Blood and soil, which is a Nazi slogan, an anti Semitic slogan that the Jews did not have so-called Aryan blood and were not of our soil. They were interlopers. Even though Jews had been in Germany for hundreds and hundreds of years, they were not of us. These are not nice people. These are not your friends. We've seen it on the left, and now we're seeing it emerging. It's always there, 
but emerging more publicly. Uh, you mentioned the Chinese Communist Party. Uh, what is the It's a great question, um, and I don't want to suggest that there's a Holocaust orthodoxy, or the orthodoxy in terms of religious, but an absolute, you know, this is what you have to believe, to be, believe in the Holocaust. Holocaust historians debate all the time. Uh, some of you I know going to John put the lectures at the museum, at the Holocaust Museum, you read books about it, we debate whose idea was the Was it Hitler? Did someone bring it to Hitler? When was it decided? How was it decided? What would America's role? Could America have done more? Could it really have made a difference? There's things to debate. But the facts are so well established. The, the, there are, are a myriad of facts. So to debate established facts, not by one or two people, but with documents, with, you know, uh, attested to by the perpetrators, attested to by the survivors, attested to by the bystanders. Um, material evidence. Um, not, I didn't debate that. Because just like I was today, would you ask someone, uh, someone who's going to be an earth scientist, would you ask them to debate someone who says the earth is flat? Yes, but we now have established evidence. No one has fallen off the face of the earth. We have established evidence that the earth is not flat. We need to debate someone who says there's no such thing as gravity. We have people, but what's happening is the anti-vaccine. There is no evidence. There is no evidence that vaccines cause autism. It was started by one journalist based on a study of 12 and uh, 12 cases. That does not establish that. There's lots of evidence that that seems stop disease. I wouldn't ask someone from the NIH to debate someone who says it's not good. We might debate why someone says it's not good. There are lots of things about facts that you can debate, of course. But something that's an established fact. I had a professor who just who described the death camps as an unintentional consequence of legal camps. I attempted to disagree with the class, but was silenced by the professor. I was then to interview the further conflict to the doctor. How would you advise a college student now? Great question. Um, I, was this you? Was this your experience? What school? Um, I do, that doesn't speak for all of Rutgers. Uh, they just published my book, so they can't be wrong. Right? Um, uh, they weren't in unintended conflict. We have enough documents um, showing the intentional, uh, the desire of uh, the leadership of the Nazi pro uh, party and the leadership of the Germany to wipe out the Jews. Um, why build gas chambers? Why or, or go to the people before the gas chambers talk about the Einsatzgruppe, the mass killing from the Eastern Front, where probably a million and a half Jews were shot. That has nothing to do with labor. Why are you deporting little children? Many of you know the story of the Warsaw Ghetto, that the uh, leader of the Jugendamt, the, the Jewish Council of the Warsaw Ghetto, ghetto Adam Chernyakov, Chernyakov, 
when he was told to include on the deportation list um, children, because then he knew this was not labor. You don't deport old people for labor. You don't deport babies for uh, labor. That's all you have. The lots of documents too. When one denies the Holocaust or says it doesn't happen, what does that mean, the Holocaust? That killing of Jews during World War II or just the event that occurred during World War II? Okay. Uh, when someone is denying the Holocaust, how do we, essentially what you're asking, how do you define the Holocaust? Correct. Um, this is one thing on which um, deniers and Holocaust historians would be. Most of the <laughs> um, with the okay, so uh, uh, um, right? Um, anyway, um, I would define the Holocaust, just doing this with some of your classmates, as state sponsored genocide to destroy the Jewish people from one end of Europe to the other end of the world. Rhodes, Orphus, Libya. Um, that does not mean, it's two things that I think have to be definitely in does not mean that the Germans did not kill lots of other civilians in a horrific fashion. Horrific. It does not mean that they were not non-Jewish prisoners in the camp. It does not mean that they killed, we don't know how many um, Roma and Sinti, you probably know them as Jews. But, and it also does not mean that had the Germans won, they would have killed lots of, they would have wiped out lots of people, Mongols, uh, Ukrainians, uh, useless eaters, as they say. Why have these people in the face of the earth if they're, they're producing food for Germany, good, but if they're just consuming food, destroy them. But, but only with the Jews it couldn't work. It couldn't wait till the end of the war and have to be done right now. So acknowledge that the Germans did horrific things to other people. Another group. Would have wiped out many people, the many groups, had they won the war. But only in the case of the Jews, and to a lesser in case with the Roma and the Sinti, did it have to happen like this. Hello, thank you for coming. Um, when real life is turned into a movie, some details have to be cut out from the film. Are there any so called deleted scenes that you wish could have made it into the film? Great question. Uh, yes. Um, first of all, um, I received support from many, many people. I received support from Jewish, many Jews, non Jews as well. Uh, but within the space of a couple of months, when word went out that we had to raise funds to pay for the warriors because they couldn't work for free as they had been doing for about a year and a half, um, people did it quietly. They didn't want it to be known. It wasn't like there was a, you know, peel to shul and put it in the paper and turn down cards and things like that. But it was quiet. One person fell in the room. And um, Balabatu, led by, mainly by Lesson Abigail Webster in uh, Columbus, Ohio, so that you know the name Webster, um, and others as well. So the Spielberg, uh, Rock, lots of big names, but also people who were smaller people. Quietly, one to another. And when I started to thank people, Les Wexner called me and he said, Deborah, don't thank us. This is our fight. Your name is on the legal document, but our history is the same. So that's one thing. The other thing is my university, Emory University. The university is founded by Methodists. Virtually every university in the United States that's old was founded by some religious denomination. Um, now, of course, a non sectarian university, heard about what was going on early on, right after it began. And the um, general counsel, the lawyer for the university, called me to his office and said, Look, one of our professors being sued is about their work. You know, not about the, where the line is in their property or the garbage can, you know, 
to the neighbors who knew where the garbage gets put at their work, we want to know that. So I briefed him about it, and then he called me back to his office a few weeks later, and I want to talk to you more about this. I said, Joe, nothing has changed. You know, this movement of glacial pace. So he said, no, no, I have something to tell you. The night before, there had been a meeting of the board of directors of the university. And they had heard, he had briefed them about the case, and they had voted to set up a fund for the $30,000, which is not a small amount of money, certainly not, not in 1997, 98. Um, and it wasn't funny money. It wasn't like they, you'll teach less, which they already, which I, I taught half time throughout the period, and they gave me off the year, you know, going to the trial, all these kind of things. Um, but it was actual money. They said, I said, what's that about? They said, look, he said, we asked of our faculty to do three things. To be first-rate teachers, to be first-rate researchers, and to be morally engaged. And we can think of nothing better than that. Than what, that represents that better than what happened to you. Um, so when people tell you, and then, I'll, let me I'll add to that story. So then it came time, uh, I knew when the trial would be, and I went to the um, provost, and I said, listen, the trial's going to start in January 2000. Um, I can't teach it. You know, I said, I said, I'm thinking of taking a sabbatical. So the provost, a good Methodist, said to me, Deborah, um, you know this better than I, but it seems to me sabbatical has its roots in Hebrew. Shabbat, to rest. Being on trial and taking a sabbatical where you're supposed to generate and write and do research a counterintuitive. I said, I guess you're right. I can take a leave of absence, which means, you know. She said, don't do anything. I said, what are you supposed to be in London all the time? She said, no, no. You be in London. Let's read it like you're teaching, except for this semester, the courtroom will be your classroom, and we will learn from you from so afar. Then when I came back after the trial, but before the verdict, so there wasn't anything to celebrate, they wanted to do a welcome home with that experience. So you know the national all the faculty, Deborah will be on campus for the two weeks between she's home and she's got to go back to London in two weeks for the trial for the verdict, but she's on campus to say we're gonna have a reception for her. So I arrived at the reception and I see the truck of the kosher caterer is there. So when, I mean Jewish studies were we have something that's a kosher event, but this was an event sponsored by the president of the university. So I came in and he greeted me and then I found the caterer and I said, How come you're catering? Said the Jewish studies rent, and he said, No, no, the president's office to rent. I said, How come they called you? She said, Well, they said to me, Deborah keeps kosher, so any reception in her honor should be a kosher event. So when people tell you that, and then they went ahead and set up a whole website, you should look at it www.hdot, Holocaust Denial on Trial.org, a great website which they have funded to preserve with the trial and to answer deniers. It's the only site that answers deniers. Not directly, but to answer the deniers. When people tell you that other people don't care, when people tell you that other people aren't interested in things that happen to Jews, I'm here to tell you that's not true. I wish that story could be. We only have a few more minutes, so we're going to finish up with the questions we have. Yes, both questions. Okay. Okay. Um, so my question is also about the movie. Um, is there anything that was in the movie that was inaccurate or exaggerated, and the case happened differently? Um, and your question? Um, so personally, I just felt that it went after I followed the TED Talk. Uh, do you feel that deniers got more of a platform to speak to lies after the TV on TV? Okay. First, anything in the movie, I, I had a dog, but I didn't have a dog at that point. That was the director the month. I actually watched the credits, because the credits of the month. Yeah. Um, actually, my favorite part of the movie is the credits. It says, Deborah, what's that racist? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, but in any case, um, not accurate. I didn't fight with the lawyers as much as it made it sound. But, but David Irving, David Harris, who was a screenwriter, needed a dramatic arc, arc so he played that out a little bit more. And the thing about the support I got just wasn't there, you know, for the little bit more. In terms of the platform, no, I don't think so. Many people worry about it. That's why the British Jews, you know, that scene where the British Jews are telling me uh, not to fight, which actually happened when he was a British community. They all came around, but they were scared. 
wasn't that they were bad people, they were frightened. And they thought Shashville was the best place. And I couldn't be Shashville because Shashville meant he wins. Um, so, and during the trial, I never talked to the press. And he was talking to the press all the time, and all these stories from winning him. And, he was, and Anthony Julius, my lawyer, would say, that we're only interested in one article. How we find the time. So, David Irving, when he's referred to now, if you Google him, you'll see David Irving, who the court declared to be a Holocaust denier. David Irving, who, uh, you know, was called an anti Semite, a racist, and a Nazi by the, by the court. Um, so, yes, they got publicity, but it's not the kind of publicity that they wanted. In fact, one of the web, not, uh, denial websites right after the trial uh, said, uh, this was our best chance for David Irving's rule. And for the first time I read the Denial of Denial site, which I said, amazing. <laughs> I was saying, a lot of times people say perception is reality. And it seemed, even back then, that David Irving gave his like, upper hand. I kind of get that feel from the movie. But now we see all these forms of anti-Semitism and controls, so, so it seems as if it's kind of reoccurring. It hasn't been just on fire for it. No, denial, hardcore denial has been debunked. It comes out, anti-Semites persist, haters persist. They don't go away. You can try to inoculate, you can try to educate others against them. I, I think this is probably my last statement, so let me, let me use this as a, a closing kind of thing. Um, you can't eradicate hatred. But you can look at it in your own self. Whether it's towards Jews with whom you disagree, whether it's towards people of different color, people of different orientation, sexual orientation, political orientation. Um, you can, am, I, am I hating them? Am I dis disagreeing with them because of what they're saying and what they're doing? Or is it just an instinctive kind of thing? I don't like X. If you say, I don't like X, and in that X, it's not a person, but it's a group, you've engaged in the same thing with the anti -Semitism. So I would urge you to look at yourself and clear yourself. I would also urge you to think you can't fight every battle. Otherwise, you go through life fighting all the time. But there's certain things you can't walk away from. But if you're going to fight them, you've got to be prepared. I was lucky. I was prepared educationally. I was prepared with people who knew me, friends who would support me. It was more than love. It was blessed than If you If you're walking down the street and someone collapses in front of you and needs CPR, it's too late to go take the court from you. You've got to be prepared. You've got to be prepared with an education. You've got to be prepared with a moral backbone. And most of all, this is the last thing I want to say to you. You also have got to be prepared to take the lonely stand. If friends of yours are, are, are being mean, are bullying, and bullying doesn't automatically lead to genocide, but still, if they're doing something that isn't right, don't go along with the crowd. We're seeing it now too much in our world. Today, day after day, stories of people who kept quiet, who looked the other way. Don't be a Protestant. Be an upstander. You're, you're learning what to stand up for. If you just learn it and file it away, but then go out and engage in mean, contemptuous acts, harbor prejudice, then it's more than an education of the at least an education. It's a turning on the head of what you do. If you take away that message, then I'm Thank you so much, and we're all very really grateful that uh, we're here today. And, uh, and you should all Google the TED Talk. If you haven't seen it, HBO TV, we've been using it in the 9th grade. It's a phenomenal website. And you have three minutes to get to class. 141. <laughs>
Ooh, I'm on camera. All right, TV. Yeah, TV. Yes, you are. Oh. I don't know yeah, if Hey, well, it's okay. Are you we can't. Hey, 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 Welcome. Out. 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 I know it's not true, it's true. That's why we're going to